Um, so Professor Chomsky is here obviously to answer your questions. Without more ado, I would, I'm not very good at press conferences, um, just throw it open to the floor and you can take a pop at uh, the man I believe is the world's most quoted academic. Most vilified. <laughs> okay, it's up to you. Um, Professor Chomsky, I was wondering uh, uh, what's your opinion on such um, overly populist left-wing agitators uh, such as Michael Moore are, and whether they're of any remote help in, in America today? Well, I don't exactly know what overly populist means. He's uh, trying to reach the general public, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, I think he's had a very significant effect. Uh, not I don't know if it's the left. He reaches a general audience. And just out of curiosity, my, I don't see films much, but uh, my wife and I went to watch uh, Bowling for Columbine and went purposely to a sort of lower middle class, working class neighborhood where they see what the react, more interested in the reaction than in the film. And it was interesting. I mean, in a way, he was mocking their beliefs and commitments, but it was a pretty enthusiastic audience, uh, whether because it wasn't entirely clear whether it was because they were regarding it as uh, satire and not meaningful, or whether they resonated to what uh, he was saying. But he certainly has, has reached a very wide audience, and not particularly the left, which he's not talking to. The, uh, the, he told that they don't like guns. but. Uh, and of course, there's a backlash. So uh, across the spectrum of uh, educated opinion from what's called left in the United States, like the New York Times, uh, which recently was uh, described as the most left-wing institution on the face of the earth by the president's uh, economic advisor, a distinguished economist from Harvard. Uh, the, uh, so from the New York Times over to Far right, there's a, they exploit his, uh, they exploit him as a, uh, a way of kind of undermine uh, anything he's speaking for. Actually, that's true in England too. I don't read the English press regularly, of course, but I did happen to be here uh, last May when the Cannes Festival was going on, and I did one or came close to winning a prize. And it was a long interview with him in one of the British journals, maybe the Independent, I don't recall, which is a rather derisive uh, interview. I don't recall the author, but uh, uh, in it he made the standard accusations that Moore lies and he's not trustworthy and so on. And the proof that he lies, the main proof that he lies, uh, which is kind of interesting, is that he claims to have come from a working class background, but his father uh, owned a house and owned a car, so he's lying. His father was an auto worker, and he's claiming to come from a working class background, which tells you something about, not about him, but about England, uh, and about the way the notion of class has been uh, eliminated from consciousness. So if a person's working class, he's not working class uh, if he happens to own a car, which every steel worker does. Uh, but uh, that's pretty standard, the kind of derision of his uh, somewhat class-based and somewhat populist critique. What the overall effect is, it's hard to say, because the propaganda is all on the other side. So what reaches uh, readers of the press and people who watch television and so on is the uh, derision and the uh, uh, fabrication about his uh, his uh, untrustworthiness and so on. On the other hand, he reached a lot large audience. So it's a mixed, mixed effect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Idris? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chomsky, I wanted to ask about the Geneva Accords. You have uh, recently um, endorsed them. And uh, I, I was wondering, I mean, how do you see them as being any different from what you call the apartheid solution of the peace process, considering that uh, the right of return is given away, yet the settlements are not dismantled either. And, uh, and more importantly, even the resources in terms of water and all these important resources, I mean... Well, that's not quite true. The uh, 
first of all, I wouldn't call the peace process, the, uh, it's unclear what you mean by the peace process, but if what you mean is the international consensus of the last uh, roughly 30 years uh, on a two-state settlement on the international border, uh, if that's what you mean by the peace process, then uh, the Geneva Accords are a fairly pro close approximation to it. And I didn't endorse them, but I suggest it is that they are a very appropriate basis for negotiation, which is why the United States unilaterally and alone opposes them. Palestinians support them, uh, Israeli doves support them, the Europe supports them, the uh, U.S. has blocked them, and so therefore they're out of discussion. Uh, but they're a, a sort of a natural evolution of the uh, negotiations that have been going forward towards some sort of settlement roughly in accord with the international consensus. Uh, the actual proposals at the Geneva Accords, uh, the wording which uh, on the right of return is ambiguous <coughs> and should be negotiated and I think can be fixed. I don't really think that's the issue because on the right of return there really is no disagreement across the board, at least among the people who care about the refugees. The fact of the matter is the refugees are not going to return to Israel, except for a symbolic number, uh, for quite a long time. I mean, it's possible that the end of a long process of accommodation and interaction and um, social and political change, there might be a possibility. But in the near term, uh, foreseeable future, it's simply deeply immoral to dangle in front of suffering people the belief that they're going to get something which they're never going to get. There is no international support for the right of return to Israel. There's very little Palestinian support at the political echelons, those who try to be realistic. And if any support ever developed, which is hard to imagine, uh, Israel would use its ultimate weapons to prevent it. Uh, meaning it, there'd be nobody left. Okay. So therefore, to tell the refugees uh, we're going to help you get the right of return is simply deeply immoral. That's not a proper way to deal with the f suffering of people who are really living in misery. Uh, they should not abandon the right of return. I think that's correct. Uh, just as the people who uh, used to live where I live and were mostly exterminated by Scotch and uh, Irish uh, colonists. Uh, they have a right of return too, but they're not going to achieve it. Uh, so the right of return is legitimate, but uh, implementation of the right is a different question. It could happen over a long period, but if we're serious, it's not going to, it can't be an, uh, an option for uh, negotiation now. The serious issue is the territorial one. Where's the boundaries? And on that, the Geneva Accords come closer to uh, the uh, international consensus than uh, anything so far. I mean, they're the first ones that call for a, a, a moderately serious one-to-one -one land swap, which means a settlement roughly on the border with some give either way. Uh, and that's... Uh, that's actually the proposals. The, these are the proposals that have been on the international agenda for 30 years. Uh, PLO accepted them. The Arab states accepted them. Just reiterated them a couple of days ago. Uh, Europe, uh, Latin America, essentially everyone. Uh, the, uh, they're not perfect, you know, but, um, uh, uh, but, but as a basis for negotiations, I think they're very sensible, which is precisely why the United States and Israel unilaterally reject them. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, having spent some time in the UK, do you think it's more a part of the European community or more an extension of America or almost another American state? That's up to Europeans. I mean, you've got your fate in your own hands. You know, Europe is a powerful part of the world. It's a, comparable to the United States or beyond it in just about every dimension except military force, which really doesn't matter in most of these issues. Uh, so it's up to uh, Europeans whether they would like to be uh, uh, sort of dependent clients of uh, U.S. military power or whether they would like to join the large majority of American public opinion, which happens to be strongly opposed to just about every policy of the U.S. government. If you look at U.S. public opinion, 
it would, it's very similar to European public opinion on just about every issue. Uh, so when you talk about the United States, you're really talking about the US, the US bipartisan, very narrow bipartisan media elite consensus, which is very remote from the population. And Europeans have to simply say, well, which America am I interested in? Uh, the America that's in favor of uh, the Kyoto Protocol, that's against the use of force in international affairs, that wants to join the International Criminal Court, that uh, is in favor of uh, spending on uh, uh, social issues and not military and so on. That's the large majority of the population. So Europeans can decide, do I want to be connected with them or do I want to be connected with uh, elite power, which has succeeded in largely marginalizing the population so that the political system is completely dysfunctional. It's a failed state in that respect. And uh, that's, that's a choice that Europeans have to make. I mean, Britain has historically made the choice of being uh, uh, the U.S. attack dog, basically. But, you know, that's a choice, not a necessity. Can I see if anyone else would like to come in for the first time? Yeah. What do you think is the best way forward for the left to consider the amount of propaganda we're up against? The lack of a mass media outlet to represent the point of view. If you take into account the Iraq war and uh, the misinformation on weapons of mass destruction, human rights abuses, and it's very hard to get your point of view across because the media is so strictly controlled. Expect. Uh you know, the media overwhelmingly are instruments of concentrated private and state power. So they're doing their job. I mean, you should criticize it, but not be surprised by it. I mean, any more than you should be surprised by the fact that uh, a major corporation is trying to raise profits. I mean, you know, you can say, you can be critical of this, that thing they're doing, but not of their policies. Uh, you can be critical of the existence of the institution, but that's a different matter. Uh, as for what the best way forward for the left is, I think it's uh, to uh, recognize that the left is really the center. Uh, if you take, I mean, like my opinions, I suspect probably yours without knowing you, uh, in the United States and in England, uh, I haven't seen polls in England, but I assume it's the same. The United States is very heavily polled, so we know a lot about public opinion. I'm right in the middle of the stream. In fact, in many respects, uh, public opinion goes beyond what I would have said. Uh, I mean, I agree with it, but I wouldn't say it. Like, for example, a majority of the public in the United States uh, thinks that uh, the U.S. ought to give up the veto of the United Nations and follow uh, majority uh, uh, decision. I mean, that is so remote from discussion that, you know, it sounds like it's from Mars. Nobody could say that, uh, or would say it, but it is the majority of the public. And uh, it's the same on other issues. I mean, say, take the Kyoto Protocol, which is just in the news. Uh, you read in the press that, uh, here too, that uh, the United States didn't uh, go along, uh, re uh, rejected the Kyoto Protocols unilaterally. Everyone else agreed. But that's true only in a very peculiar sense. Now, if you really despise democracy with uh, passion, it's true. Uh, the U.S. government did vote against it. But the American public is very strongly in favor of it. So if the public is part of the United States, it's not true that the U.S. opposed it. Uh, the public, in fact, is so strongly in favor of it that a majority of Bush voters assumed that he was in favor of it because it's such an obvious thing to be in favor of. Uh, and uh, the same goes through on issue after issue. And take just pure domestic issues. So the federal budget just came out a couple of weeks ago. You go through the federal budget, uh, you know, what it expanded, what it cut, and so on. If you look at public opinion, which is carefully studied, it's exactly the opposite on every issue. Every issue, you run through it. If uh, the budget says X, uh, public says not X. Uh, dramatically. Uh, and uh, in a country where the public has been largely excluded from the political arena, like the United States or England to a large extent, uh, it sort of doesn't matter. You know, and the media don't report it. Uh, 